Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. Pleasure to be here again. Um, and uh, this is an interesting session because uh, this is something which is really topical that uh, we are all going to talk about, which is on ESG and what is happening in the whole world of ESG. So my name is Girish Ramchandran. I work for the Tata Group. Um, and uh, I have a set of esteemed panelists with me. I'll, I'll talk through uh, with all of them to get a quick view on what is happening around the world in the area of ESG. But I want to just give some context to this. Do you know that the average um, age of a company today in NASDAQ is less than 20 years? So no company is now able to be in NASDAQ now for more than 20 years. Okay. And then you look at companies who have really been through this journey of being with 100, 150 plus years, like the Tata Group. Okay. What you see is that um, whether it is Unilever, whether it's IKEA, whether it is SMBC, um, companies like that, you see that there is some special qualities that these organizations have. And that is about caring for the community at large. And that is what we will unpack in this particular session. So it is not all about the E part, which is what people now talk a lot about, which is on the carbon space, but it's on the social and the governance piece as well. Okay. Now, if you look at what has the pandemic brought about, the pandemic has had several positive impacts on the whole concept about ESG. And uh, we have had a set of stakeholders, namely regulators, investors, customers, partners, governments, communities, and employees. All of them are looking at the ESG lens in a very specific way. Let's take, um, for example, um, employees. Okay. When we are going and recruiting the Gen Ys and the Gen Zs from the world, all of them are willing to take a pay cut and join a company which has a significant history in the area of giving. Okay. And even if you look at consumers, today consumers are pushing businesses to become more and more their products and services to be much, much more sustainable. And that's something which we are seeing. And those companies who are not bringing in products in this particular space are actually weathering away. Okay. And uh, we are also seeing a significant amount of standards coming in. There is a whole lot of new standards coming in, in the area of ESG. And uh, businesses like all of us are grappling with the what standards to adopt. And then there is also regulators who are looking at how do we uh, pick what standards to, for, for each and every sector. Okay. If you look at Asia, this conference is all about Asia, and if you look at that, it has actually been lagging other regions if you look at investment in adoption of sustainability-focused practices. But if you look at uh, the latest um, MSCI institutional survey, 57% of Asia-Pacific investors expect to have completely or to a large extent incorporated ESG issues into their investment analysis and decision-making process by another two years. So there is definitely a significant push that we see in the last couple of years in the whole area of ESG. And COVID has really given a wake-up call to strengthen this whole global efforts to reorient towards a capital flows towards a more sustainable future. Okay. And um, the other one that we see is that Asia is definitely on a slower trajectory. And that is something that we need to see how do we catch up when you look at um, other places like Europe in this particular space, considering that most of the world um, is going to be residing in this particular part of the world. And this is the manufacturing hub for the world. How do we quickly take uh, sustainability practices into this? Okay. 
So the question that we will try to see is that will the acceleration in ESG regulation lead to better realization of sustainability goals? Or will stronger parameters throttle Asian investors in this time of low growth and high inflation? Okay. So I have a set of uh, um, panelists. We have Juan, who is the chairman of um, Halcom. We have Joe. Joe has uh, got a variety of functions. He's the co-founder, board member, chief architect of Digital Garage. And he spent a significant time at MIT Labs. We have Kanako-san, who is the deputy head of uh, sustainability at SMBC. And we have To, who is the director and co-founder of Entelco uh, in Japan. And she, she does a very interesting, they do significant work in the area of um, helping companies achieve their ESG goals. Okay. So I want to hear from each of them on their point of view on this, and then we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit. Shall we start with you, Juan? Thank you, uh, Iris, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Huan from uh, Vietnam. I am uh, founder, also the chairman of the company called Hancom. We are a private company and working uh, in two sectors. One is a consulting for ODI projects and another that investments. Um, for the consulting, we work mainly for uh, World Bank and uh, ADB, uh, JICA, and so with donors for the uh, poor reduction during last 20 years, more than 20 years, and the uh, infrastructure development. And uh, for investment, we are also the owners of the, um, some water supply projects, drinking water supply projects, and uh, renewable energies. We are also owners of the wind farms and the solars. And um, now we are developing for some solid waste to energies. Um, so mainly that we focus on green developments. And uh, I myself also involved in some uh, social activities, and maybe that's why uh, I'm uh, the few uh, private sectors uh, members to be selected to be the parliament member of Vietnam uh, from last year. Uh, I come here today that uh, would like to learn something from you guys to each chain about the green developments, net zero, and how to face uh, with that challenging, especially for Vietnamese, for, for Vietnam's developing countries. And I also willing to share with you some experience from private entrepreneurs. Thank you. Juan, maybe uh, before we get everybody, um, I want to ask you a specific question. Um, you are seeing the transition from organizations in Vietnam um, or helping organizations move from fossil fuel to sustainable fuel. Okay. How is that, how is that, uh, that going across in Vietnam? What, what, what are you seeing in this particular space? Um, you know, Vietnam typically and uh, developing country, we also have to keep a balance between growth and sustainable development. Um, but, but which one could be selected first? Mm. Uh, for example, like in Vietnam, we have some uh, arms, I mean the governments, I have some purpose that uh, in 19, uh, sorry, 20 and 30, we try to uh, be out of the uh, low middle income countries. Right. So that means the uh, GDP per person like uh, 7,000 or something. Um, so that means every year we have to keep the rates about seven or even 7.5% per year right. to keep that uh, target. But on, on another hand, that uh, we have to keep the, the environmental protections and, uh, and even some commitment, mm. like uh, our Prime Minister uh, said in the COP26 that we get uh, net zero in 2050s. Mm. Um, in that sense, if we don't pay attention on the protection, climate change, and so on, and like a good bank uh, in, in Vietnam, office, they, uh, they have a calculation that uh, if we are going that way, in 2030 or 2035, Vietnam has to pay about 6% of GDP per year to repair that, uh, the fail we didn't do today. That means we don't protect the environment. So that made the governments and the enterprise, their own stakeholders have to 
to consider that uh, which, which one should be priorities and which one should be focused. And after considering, now still in a debate in the, um, in the country, that hopefully at the end of this year or earlier of next year, we will have an intensive plan, overall plans, master plan for the whole country, that uh, we can make a roadmap how to get a natural and, and so and so and keep the roads. But in general, we have to keep the balance. We cannot say that uh, we, we just focus on the growth rate, or we have to keep the commitment. Yeah. Because that also uh, uh, link together, impacts together. Then if we don't, we just place something on, on the growth rate, and then maybe uh, we can get stuck like a 2025, 20, 2030, we get stuck, then we cannot develop anymore. So that's a problem for the developing country. So. No, thank and you. Vietnam. Joe, you've done some very interesting work uh, on, on the whole, whole area of tech. Yeah. You should give a quick view on what, what are you doing in this particular space and what are you hearing on, uh, on ESG. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of hats. So, so Digital Garage, by the way, we set it up almost 30 years ago, went public a little over 20 years ago. So we're almost at your death <laughs> age. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but we've been around and I, was, I moved away 14 years ago, came back last year to take an operating position as well in my company. So we're just trying to figure out the context of SCGs in Japan. But um, for, when I was in the States, I, I, was on, I did a lot of work with philanthropists. I were, was on the MacArthur Foundation Board and the Knight Foundation Board. And at MIT, the area that I focused on was looking at um, me measures of impact. And one of the things that we worked with quite a bit was looking at the second order effects and looking at the, the, the risk of optimizing for simple measures and the reduction causes often unexpected negative second order effects. And we wrote a lot of policy um, papers talking foundations out of optimizing for certain things um, that were too short-sighted. And it's very difficult, this kind of trade-off between standardization and um, impact, actual impact. And we developed a number of probabilistic computing models in conjunction with surveys to try to standardize or at least make it data-oriented, but still capturing second-order effects. Um, and I'm currently the board chair of um, Happiness Capital, which is the impact fund for the LKK family. And we've, together with 60 Decibels and Jed Emerson and a few others, come up with our own impact measures where we're looking at all the stakeholders in the system and looking at the impact on those stakeholders. But it's, it's very customized to what we want to do because the LKK family has impact goals. And when I try to look at that and then look at the ESG measurements and things like that, it's for me very difficult with these apples and oranges. And I spent the train down here just reading all of the different reports and studies on um, ESG measures. and and very excited to learn. So, so the, the thing that I'm trying to contribute now is really to come up with rigorous probabilistic computing models that allow some standardization, but much more second order effect, third order effect measurement than just optimizing for single things like carbon or you know, books re borrowed from libraries and things like that. And I'm, I'm interested in where this is going. So are you seeing, are you seeing any convergence of uh, this uh, um, measurement in terms of because there is so everybody now is talking about carbon and there is definitely a move towards at least a net zero but it's not the same thing on, on the S and the G part so are you seeing any convergence in this particular space so, so uh, the the area that I'm looking at the layer is really um, the future of accounting really okay. it's, it's it's really how do we take these messy ERP models and to try to standardize both the, the language of the models as well as the way we collect the data so that we can look at live probabilistic models mm -hmm. rather than, than numbers. And it's going to take a little while, and I think that things like the carbon ecosystem and um, um, pay gap and, and those areas will be places where we can try to build models that are somewhat standardized. But we still have to have a lot of conversations about what we're, because what we're optimizing for. But I, but I think there's a lot of progress. But it's it's quite at a low level, and I think things like blockchain and Web3, it may be counterintuitive, but they will drive systems towards more standardization, which I think will create the raw material for the probabilistic models to then um, adapt for. And you were mentioning to me something on the pay gaps. 
yeah. so, uh, one, one so, interesting so, study, right? So maybe it's a good idea yeah, to so, tell. So without going into too much detail, what the, the probabilistic modeling that we're doing is kind of like a combination of structured learning, sort of like expert systems in the old days with modern machine learning. And so what we can do is we can ingest, say, uh, the, 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 the numbers from a company. We were using the, the Stack Overflow um, developer survey, which is a publicly available large data set of surveys. But we've now built a system where you can ask in natural language something like, you know, what is the pay gap index for this person? Or what group in this company has the best uh, gender equality given equivalent uh, experience and and you should we'll be able to ask those th questions in natural language so that initially this first application will be so a board can say you know what group in our um, you know company had the most shift you know what age range is it the most this and that and and just ask in natural language eventually uh, we'll be able to com compare models because because it's quite nuanced because the, the the way you ask a question what's the median difference you know and and and, and are because it's not just apples and oranges and i think the problem right now is data science requires a computer science degree and a lot of time but we should be able to ask natural language questions against um, data from public data or also from corporate data without any delay and that that and it should be an iterative thing and then eventually all employees and all shareholders should be able to ask basic, obvious questions against um, data sets. Thank you. To I'll come to you, To. Um, <clears throat> you do some uh, very interesting work in the overall area of ESG. What, what is happening in this particular space across? What are you seeing? Um, so to answer that question first, I probably need to explain sure. a little about what we do Please. because uh, we, we work, um, we're an ESG, well, sustainability consulting company, but we work very much on the people side of that transformation. What we are seeing is that when it comes to ESG, companies get very fixated on the processes, the systems, the data, and that absolutely is important. We need that information to understand what are our priorities, where do we need to focus our efforts. Um, but to sort of um, comment on what Joe was just talking about there, this is um, language that is data and data science. We really need to understand as people, what does this mean for us? So what the work we do is focused on helping companies align the organizational culture, the mindsets and behaviors of the employees right from the CEO, right the way down to the, the shop floor, the factory, whatever that is, so that they actually understand what does this mean for us when my company says it has this strategy or we're trying to achieve net zero or we're trying to reduce uh, biodiversity loss or whatever it is that they're talking about, that they can understand how that connects to the work they do every day. Because unless that happens, people will just see it as something that's been pushed down from on top and nobody likes being pushed to change, right? If you push people generally, they push back. And so what we look at doing is understanding okay, what is um, the company trying to achieve? What do people in the organization know so far? What's the level of awareness? What's the level of um, engagement with this? Do they believe in what the company is trying to do? Are they, you know, do they think it's sincere or do they think it's greenwashing? Um, and then are they empowered within the organization to take action on that? Because another issue we see is that um, when it comes to ESG, the, the company at a strategic level can have very clear goals, but when it comes to measuring what people are doing every day and how you're evaluating the performance of your employees, if those are not connected, then it doesn't make sense for people to change. You're not incentivizing the right behavior either. So as well as the mindsets and behaviors, we need to understand within the organization, how are we motivating people to do this? How are we talking about it? Are, oh, am I as a leader in my team or my division actually evaluating people the right way, giving them the right um, directions and goals so that everything can lead in the same direction? So that's the, the kind of work we do. And I think to, to answer your question on what are we seeing, um, yes, in some respects, if you look at the, the pure metrics, um, Japan might be behind in certain areas um, compared to, say, Europe or um, you know, North America for, so, um, for certain areas. However, I think it's, uh, as Joe, again, you were saying, it's not just about the, 
the hard data, the numbers, you need to understand what's actually happening underneath the surface. And I think um, there are a lot of companies in Japan where the old companies like Tata Group, um, Japan has a huge number of very old organizations where uh, sustainability mindset is very deeply embedded in the DNA of the company, actually, that, that sense of um, service, and I think Richard was talking about this in the, the previous um, panel, but you know, there, there's a very deeply embedded sense of responsibility towards people outside the company, the people you serve, and the planet, and a, a way of taking care of that, that perhaps isn't easy to measure in the current ESG frameworks. So I think we need to step back and take a more holistic view and look not just at the, the numbers coming out in an ESG report, but actually what's the impact companies are having. Um, and if we're looking more holistically at impact rather than just numbers on reduction in GHG um, emissions, then I think we get a clearer picture. And in some respects, Japan and Asia in general is really um, has a lot to teach um, the rest of the world on that. That's very encouraging. Um, uh, Kanako san, you, you actually represent really the corporate Japan uh, in this panel, okay? And uh, not just corporate Japan, but also um, a very large institution um, who's been um, through the many generations, uh, if you may. And um, how are you adopting ESG into into your day-to-day -day life, and and you you actually, as part of your responsibility, are focused on that particular thing. So, can you throw a little bit in them what yeah. you do and yeah? Thank you, Girish. Yeah, uh, I'm from Sumitomo Banking Corporation, so it's one of the um, several large major banks in Japan, and uh, in the global banking industry, since last year, uh, we have actually have an international alliance called Net Zero Banking Alliance, who really would like to push the uh, global industry's decarbonization from the financial industry, the banking perspective, and uh, the. We, in the uh, last year, we have been working for uh, how we are going to measure the efforts of the industry, and uh, we have been uh, agreeing that uh, uh, probably we should measure what we call financed emissions of the uh, banks, and uh, uh, try to uh, uh, set on a medium-term target for the uh, high, high, high intensive uh, how to abate sectors, and the try to um, measure the progress of the reduction of the uh, what is called financed emissions. And recently we started to face with a uh, challenge that, oh, the transition of the uh, how to abate sector is much more important than reducing the financed emissions for the individual banks. Mm. Uh, once, uh, if a bank try to really reduce their own financed emissions only, they might just uh, dispose the exposure and another bank may lend to them. Uh, that way, the uh, global uh, uh, emissions is not going to reduce. So uh, rather than just focusing on to the, uh, measuring the financial emissions for each bank and to try to set on a reduction target, probably we should uh, take a bit more wider view and in order to uh, push the uh, uh, GHG emissions reduction on the global sense rather than the individual bank basis. That's the most recent our uh, hot discussion. And, uh, responding to that uh, direction, for example, G funds, uh, the Glasgow Financial uh, Alliance for Net Zero recently came up with a report that a bank should uh, put more focus on uh, transition plan and also or the uh, managed phase out of the hard debate sectors rather than just measure and reduce the finance emissions. So uh, likewise, uh, I found your uh, discussion very interesting that uh, setting and uh, an finding of the right metrics is going to be a, sometimes very challenging. And in the bank space in the recent discussion, we started to not, gradually notice that the financial emissions is not the golden measurement, <laughs> rather than we should pay attention to. Oh, uh, recently, for example, the Japanese industry sector have an uh, discussion that uh, we probably may 
it disclose uh, what is called avoided emissions mm. uh, through the business promotion of those uh, industry players. They can provide uh, uh, emission reduction type of uh, uh, add value to the, their customers. And then uh, we should measure that uh, aspect rather than finance emissions. But uh, uh, also, there are lots of uh, argument on the avoided emissions concept as well, because uh, sometimes someone may say that avoid, avoided emission may be a typical greenwashing. <laughs> so we really have to probably purify the definition and uh, probably improve, need to improve the transparency of such metrics. Uh, but then, uh, uh, probably, uh, working on such a purification of the measurements is what we really need to uh, keep pushing rather than just avoiding the discussion, uh, argument of the greenwashing. Um, I had a question especially because you are a bank and you today fund a lot of projects. Um, and typically, uh, most people get accused that you keep your my kitchen clean, uh, but uh, I don't worry about what happens outside. Okay. That has been the attitude a lot of organizations have had uh, in this particular space. How are you pricing in climate risks, for example, when you are, when you are funding a project? Is that something that you currently look at? Yeah, uh, yeah. we sometimes use the word of ESG integration in the financial industry that uh, how, how well we are going to integrate the externality of the ESG-dated metrics into the uh, financial accounting. And, uh, uh, ESG integration in the real sense is not, go, not going to be very easy for financial institutions like ourselves. But uh, even though, or like uh, in, in our bank, for example, we started to uh, build in uh, economic incentives for the, for example, renewable energy projects in order to uh, uh, front offices to uh, uh, go a bit more aggressive to the uh, uh, green projects for the financing. So that's a, a typical way for financial industries to implement our kind of internal carbon pricing mechanisms uh, rather than waiting for the public uh, carbon uh, pricing mechanism to be implemented in the form of, uh, let's say, a carbon tax or anything like that. Thank you. Joe, Joe I want to come to you, Joe. Uh, we have a set of business leaders who are here. Okay. And what I always tell now is that uh, what COVID has probably taught us is that every, every business is a tech business. Okay. And uh, COVID has really proved that. Okay. Um, what are you seeing? I mean, what can you tell the business leaders about technology and how can technology help um, on this whole movement towards sustainability, business sustainability? How, do, how, do you, how, can, how can it help? Well, I definitely think you're probably more equipped to answer this question as DCS than I am. Um, and I, I'm not sure this ties directly with COVID, but I, I think that um, the, the, what, what I see, there's, this is not exactly the way others may see it, but the, the big thing that happened this year was um, generative AI. And this is related to the probabilistic models. But what we'll see, I think, is um, both an ability to interpret information by lay people. This ties to what we were saying earlier, but it will also create the ability to generate models. So right now, everybody's been seeing this, you type a phrase and it shows, it creates a picture, right? And this, oh, artists are going to be displaced. Well, artists are just the first group, the lawyers, accountants. You're gonna be able to say, I want to take TCS's model, but apply it to Japanese regulations, make it one one thousandth the size, click. And with blockchain and smart contracts, you will be able to create a best practice copy mm. of your company with all of the measures, and what we'll start to see is AI-generated organizations. So a lot of organization transformation, a lot of learnings that we see. So, so, so what blockchain and smart contracts will do is allow us to have transparency in relationships, in accounting, and in data. I think that's gonna be one of the large impacts of blockchain, but together with generative AI and the ability to also ask inference questions, we'll learn from cases. So, so even this recent, FTX fiasco. Yeah. I mean, parts of it, the old economy parts, will be worse than Enron take forever. But the stuff on the blockchain, one week later, we know everything. And, we, and, and in, instead of doing a whole case study and teaching it and learning from it, 
all the blockchain parts, everyone's already learned from it within a day or two. And so, so the ability to learn from mistakes, copy best practices, measure things, and share things will increase substantially with technology. And I think that if we do it in the right way, um, I think that, that governance and all these things. So, so what, what my learning is on the blockchain side, what we're learning from FTX, what we're trying to do is can we design something that makes it technically impossible to do what Sam Bankman-Fried does. Yes, we can. And instead of just regulating, I think we should start to create technical measures against bad governance. And I think that the piece that we haven't done enough is when you bring technology into law, into governance, um, can we significantly improve our performance as well? And that, that I think, again, this, over the next few years, in the wake of some of these fiascos, I think we'll start to see a lot of tools for that. Yeah, just, be just because you asked me what, what are we doing, uh, we, we ourselves have become a carbon neutral company. Uh, but what we've also done is that um, we have tried putting together a simple app. Because we are 650,000 employees, um, we said that uh, we have to find our own way of each and every employee should be able to capture what is their carbon footprint. So we have created an app today by which we are able to capture our own carbon footprint on a daily basis. And uh, we are using tech like data and data analytics and uh, IoT, and uh, which is going to be pervasive now in the next few years, um, to see how we are able to reduce our energy bills, our water consumption, uh, how do we reduce our food waste. So a whole lot of things uh, using tech, uh, we are able to today deliver uh, value to. So not only internal TCA, internal organization, but also to the external world as well. Okay. Um, uh, Juan, I want to come to you. Um, you talked uh, passionately about the fact that um, developing countries need to grow. Economic growth is most critical for developing countries. Okay. And, uh, but you also need to balance it out with, with uh, ESG goals as well. Okay. Are you really seeing um, transfer of tech coming in from the Western world um, so that it, they it really helps Vietnam through this transition of uh, how do you move towards, uh, uh, towards uh, an ESG or sustainable goals? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, like uh, for Vietnam, if we get that both targets, we need own guide like uh, all of you, like uh, sustainable development uh, policy, how to way to do uh, tech, uh, technologies and the financials also have to come to, to Vietnam. Uh, but in, in that case, you know, uh, actually I have to tell that uh, if we just think about uh, gas, how um, uh, glass, how gas emissions right. in like in Vietnam or some other countries just occupy very, very small percentage, like in Vietnam, just 0.8% of the global or something. And some other, some developed country, big country, they can, um, like a US at 12%, and some other, like a China, 23% or so on. But in, in, in that sense, if we compare about that, it, it doesn't um, uh, tell that the, the economic, the technologies, and productivity in, in, in which level of the world. Like if we divide through the USD or GDP and the Vietnam, Indonesia, and so on, that is quite high in comparison with another, like a Germany or, or US, then that I would like to say that the technology is very important. In if the developing country like Vietnam, we still leave them to work in their way, develop in their way. The technology is not transferred, so the emission is thin, uh, can be bond much more than. And if we own developed country and own another remain part of the world, try to call, try to make the campaigns for reduce uh, the emission, it, it doesn't work. So I think that uh, that duty is not only for the developing country, but also for all the world. But for developing country, we also understand that uh, not only the past small part of the emissions, and we don't care about that because of the climate change. Climate change, when we say about climate change, we have to definitely to devise to the two uh, components. One is adaptation, and another is uh, that uh, mitigation. Adaptation must more occupy the money, I mean the financial, more than mitigation. And if developing country don't pay attention on the mitigations, and nobody want to help them, for adaptation, 
that I, I would like to say then then in this case not only the duty the benefit for each company uh, each country have to involve in the climate change and zero but that also responsibility for to taking on the, another part of the of the world to cooperate with with developing country Thank you. Uh, Toh, I want to come to you. We, we spoke about the whole concept about everybody now in the world is talking about net zero. And we need to move from net zero to net impact. Uh, that, that particular model has to work. And uh, if you can unpack a little bit about, especially on the why, why, why is social as well as stewardship more important in implementing change? today in this particular world. Can you just unpack a little bit on that? Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure if I'd say if it was more important. It's equally as important. OK. Um, we, we have to realize that um, we're just one species on this planet. Um, and we're all very, very interconnected. So it's interesting listening to what Juan's saying about um, you know, the difference between the situation in developing countries and developed countries and how we need to factor that in when we're looking at ESG globally and what we're pushing um, businesses and countries to do. But I also think we need to look at it on an even bigger scale and say, okay, well, you know, we can look at the environmental factors, yes, but we've got to look at all of the pieces of the picture and how these all fit together. And take a systems thinking approach, or we, we talk a lot about ecosystem thinking in our work, and understanding the impact, as you said. So not just um, the, the concrete measures, but how do all these pieces fit together? So when we're making our strategies around environmental issues, how are those impacting people? And is it a fair transition that we're asking for? Um, and there was a wonderful um, quote from one of the panels, uh, one of the dialogue sessions I listened to earlier on today. Um, I think uh, Yuki Aizawa said, we can't copy and paste approaches from one country to another. And I thought that was a really interesting takeaway because um, you know, what works on the, the social uh, measures in one country will be completely inappropriate and not relevant to another country. So um, in that sense, it's really, really important to understand these and say, OK, if we're setting um, targets around gender equality um, in Japan, but you know, perhaps we're, uh, yesterday or two days ago, I was on a, uh, an event for DEI that's Scandinavian country uh, companies looking at what they're working with in Japan. And the, the measures that they're, or the targets they're setting from headquarters in Scandinavia absolutely appropriate there and very realistic. But when they try and achieve the same targets in their Japan offices, it just is, isn't working. They're really struggling to implement that um, because they're not taking into account perhaps enough the, the cultural differences, the cultural norms, how these things are impacting that. And the same goes for you know how the, the environmental and the social parts fit together. So. What about the level of awareness? And what, what are the key environmental issues in different countries? They will vary a lot. Um, some countries are feeling the effects much more um, strongly. And therefore, the social and the environmental are much more strongly tied together. It makes a lot more sense. They feel a sense of urgency. Whereas maybe for us sitting here in Japan very comfortably, I, I live in Japan. I've been here for more than 20 years. We get we've been getting more severe typhoons and hotter summers. But in general, we can switch our aircon on. It's pretty comfortable. Um, and so it's easy to, to forget about, um, to just focus on the environmental and, and forget about the human impact beyond that. So I think it really needs to be looked at holistically. And we need to understand the interdependencies between the social and the environmental, and then look at how the governance element is tying those things together. Kanakos, and I want to come to you, but I want to just leave. Uh, uh, after this, I'll open it for questions. If anybody has questions, please get ready with your questions. I want to ask you this. Uh, you know, it's always uh, very tough uh, in the area of sustainability, uh, especially you are a sustainability professional yourself, okay? to get alignment between investors, mm -hmm. customers, business, as well as the entire stakeholders. Okay? 
how do we how do you align the requirements of all of these people okay. what 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 is if we, if we can give some examples and some some uh, real and um, uh, tips to people on on how do you how do you enable the entire ecosystem and if anybody else wants to comment we'll be very happy to do that as well yeah come right right uh, yes yes uh, in a financial markets uh, i would recall that the uh, uh, total amount of global uh, sustainable finance has really expanded very rapidly in the last two years or so. And uh, for example, at 2015, for example, the sustainable finance was a very tiny niche market within the global finance market. And the situation totally changed in the last two years. And uh, last year, uh, it became the situation that it's not no more European situation. Last year, the uh, US uh, sustainable finance market started to jump up. And also in Asia, we started seeing a lot of very good uh, transactions. So uh, really, in uh, just these past 12 months or so, we start to see that uh, situation, the sustainable finance is becoming a very popular financial instrument within the financial market. But on the other hand, uh, the common ground between the uh, investors and uh, businesses is uh, still uh, somewhat limited because of the, uh, all the discussions today that uh, 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 metric standards is not really clear. Uh, though uh, improve, uh, promoting a uh, social impact is really a, a, a good thing, but uh, we don't know uh, what measurement is going to be a golden measurement for which industry. <laughs> So uh, probably, and uh, uh, for example, uh, in the financial market, we start to see a quite uh, improved popularity of what we call sustainability linked loans or linked bonds, which really use the, uh, some uh, sustainability related metrics as a driver for the finance. And uh, uh, we gradually face with the challenge that uh, how we are going to choose the right metrics which is aligned to the uh, business purposes of the business players. So uh, probably we really have to, going forward, uh, really work on the purification and the improving the transparency of those metrics uh, selection process. And that way, uh, we really have uh, started to have a uh, common language between uh, financial markets and uh, business sectors. Uh, what Promoting what metrics is really good for the world <laughs> Uh, while the, uh, promoting another uh, metrics is just a good inwashing. Yeah. No, we are seeing, for example, uh, integrated reporting more and more getting popular because of the fact that it just brings um, the whole concept about not just looking at one stakeholder, multi but multi-stakeholders into, into this. Are there any questions for the panel? Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, that's really a, a killer question for financial institutions that uh, every time we promote sustainable finance uh, in a very initial phase, we started to face, face with a question from the company's CFOs whether sustainable finance is cheap or not compared to the normal loans. And the answer is it's not cheap. <laughs> and also that needs uh, extra work to, you know, uh, uh, prepare for the additional disclosure around the ESG information. So uh, from the company's perspective, those financing uh, measurements uh, tend to be uh, you know, burdensome, and in terms of finance costs, uh, it's not cheap. Uh, though uh, in the past several years in the capital markets, for example, because of the uh, bias between the uh, demand and supply, uh, the several transactions closed in uh, tine, uh, tighter spreads than others, uh, which was called uh, sometimes green, green premium in some cases, but it's just uh, demand, demand supply 
a gap effect rather than uh, the fact that the market is really pricing green projects as a cheaper risk and uh, uh, lesser risk. So all the, uh, this is a challenge, the almost uh, always a challenge for the financial markets that uh, everybody really have to share the understanding that uh, though all ESG metrics are not fully integrated in a financial accounting, uh, we really have, have an uh, assumption that in the future, those seems to be integrated gradually, like uh, carbon tax implemented in some jurisdictions and so on. Uh, that's my answer to your first question. And uh, I, I think I forgot your second question, sorry. <laughs> I see. This is the percentage we must pay towards companies who have a certain ESG rating or a certain environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. At the, uh, at the moment, in, at SMBC, we don't have any future target for companies to uh, have certain level of ESG related assets, uh, the minimum percentage, for example. But uh, going forward, uh, for example, uh, along with GFAN's most recent reports, uh, we are recommended to uh, see our loan portfolio in uh, four different pools to be uh, distributed. And probably uh, at the moment, for example, SMBC just announced the uh, finance uh, sustainable finance origination targets only. So it's flow concepts, not a stock concept. But uh, in the future, probably uh, banks are, are inclined to work more on to the uh, kind of coloring the uh, portfolio, loan portfolio in uh, balance-based uh, balance concepts and try to in increase the proportion of the green balance sheet versus brown balance sheet and uh, uh, implement some measure to accelerate reducing the brown part of the portfolio. So uh, in the coming years, uh, it, might, it is somewhat probable that uh, many banks started to work on those uh, uh, balance-based concepts, target setting, and they gradually work, uh, encourage clients to, uh, for example, increase the proportion of the uh, green business portfolio within their balance sheet. Thank you. Thank you. There was another question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Hi. I actually had a, a question. Um, it's a bit of a two-part question as well. Um, also working in the sustainability space, there's two issues that I consistently run into. The first being capability. So one of the things that we lack pretty profoundly in organizations is sustainability capability, pretty much up and down the company and also across. Um, we see in business in general, most people coming in business, as many in this room, study business in school and they learn about finance and learn about marketing and lots of things to kind of help them get knowledgeable, but sustainability is still very much a new concept. I think in 15 years this will get better, but we don't have the time now. So how do we build that capability quickly? And then the second question is a question of value. So oftentimes people don't necessarily see the value in, um, in ESG Type, type metrics or even sustainable innovation. How do we ensure that kind of markets and investors and people in general price in the value that can be created um, through being a more ESG aligned organization? Thank you. So you want to take it up there? Yes. Thank you. I'm just writing down both parts of the question to try and remember. Um, so to the first part of your question around capability, Yes, I would absolutely agree. This is a huge gap we're seeing at the moment. Um, and this is where um, companies really need to take a long-term view and invest in building that capability within the organization, whether that is selecting key people across different functions, um, starting with the senior leadership, the ones that are responsible for, for strategy implementation, um, and then cascading that down through, or whether it's uh, sort of taking a more holistic approach. It might depend on the size of the company, to be honest. Um, but there needs to be commitment to that. And um, I think somebody earlier mentioned common language, building a common language around it. And I think, 
Um, at the moment, a lot of companies are still, still seeing sustainability strategy implementation as the job of the sustainability department or yep. team, and not as uh, a shared responsibility. <laughs> I can see Katakon San agreeing with me here. Um, not as a shared responsibility across every function in the organization. That thinking needs to change, and the companies that are beginning to recognize that are taking steps towards saying, okay, well, how do we get key people from these different functions to work together with the sustainability team who will probably be the ones setting the strategy along with the CEO and the rest of the C-suite. But the people elsewhere in the company also need to understand how this connects directly to what they do every day. Um, the second part around value, um, I think we were talking earlier about what is, um, how a company's measuring value. And I think, um, perhaps Joe, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Because I think that was something you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I, th I think, um, I, since we're running out of time, I won't go too far, but I, but I think it's really important to decide what the goal is before you decide what the measurement is. And we have you know, risk mitigation, higher returns, societal impact. And I think those are completely different things they're related. And I think one of the things that's very confusing to me is sometimes it's not clear when you see, even within ESG, they have different things and it's not clearly labeled sometimes. And so for me, that is fundamental and, and I, I, I don't know how, how, how you, <laughs> where, where, you if, where you think about that, that common language around that is from there, I think. Yeah. I, have, I know the time is over. I have one, one quick thing to wind up. Um, I'm sorry, but I, I will not be able to. We'll, we'll, we will be here after this, and you can you can ask us privately about the question. I have one last thing to just a quick this thing: Is the world uh, doing enough on ESG compliance? And where do you see? Are you optimistic that what we are doing today will impact the world in the next 10 to 15 years? One, maybe a quick. Uh, quick. Time is over, but uh, then I just say that. Um, uh, now, now the thing, the, I, I don't say anything about a global stress, but I think that that's the time now. The country, all the country, developed country, developing country, I think that we, we should work together. And the companies in each country should understand the policy of each government. And also the global state policies, we follow international standards. We go together, they will achieve the results. So I'm very pessimistic now because I think top-down pressure doesn't work, but now that you opened with this, the Gen Z, yeah. the employees, the consumers are waking up. I think that's the goal. That will, It's like the early electric vehicles didn't sell until the consumers right. wanted it. So I think we're ready to go. Cool. Um, in short, no, we're not doing enough, definitely, but I'm going to be a stubborn optimist and also clicking into the theme of the, the previous panel, we're at a turning point, I think. This is an opportunity and we need to jump in with both feet. Yeah, uh, I also share the uh, worry that uh, the, what we have been doing so far is not enough. Uh, I really agree with that. Uh, but uh, uh, we started to see a uh, tiny good phenomena that uh, in some part, the, uh, for example, recognition is really ac uh, accelerating. So uh, I really would like to bet on that small good <laughs> momentum that situation would probably accelerate and uh, go into the right direction. So on that uh, very optimistic note that we will see the future brighter if all of us start adopting sustainability as a way, to, way of life. We'll end this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your time, and see you.